Welcome to Trailers from Hell. I saw 55 Days at Peking on the giant 70mm screen when I was 17 and naturally I thought it was terrific. In fact, I used the title in dialogue in my first film, The Man from Hong Kong, in which Hugh Keysburn berates Jimmy Wong Yu for beating up some spells. <laughs> Call it. Oh, shut up, Bob. Hey, enough's enough. Extradite Wing Chan, that's what you came here to do. But everywhere you go, you just commit mayhem, man. Look, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you my list of contacts. I'll give you every name I've painstakingly bloody gathered over the past two years, and you can do the lot of them. This is Australia, mate. Not 55 days at Peking. I'd written Jimmy's reaction to be a contemptuous shrug. But I have to respond to that, said Jimmy. Don't you understand what an insult that is to Chinese people? Clearly, I did not. I'd always accepted the movie version of the Boxer Rebellion as gospel. This French cartoon of the period reveals the underlying issues. Foreign powers had been carving up China into separate spheres of influence for 40 years, while missionaries had been converting tens of thousands to Christianity. The Chinese people believe the Boxer Rebellion was a popular uprising to restore national sovereignty. So I reshot the scene, and I gave Jimmy a close-up to give his response. Hey, don't give me any shit! <laughs> it's his best line in the picture. This is the forbidden city of Peking in the year 1900. History is written by the victors, so naturally the boxers, the Yihe Tuan, or Fists of Righteous Harmony, are depicted not as heroic anti-imperialists, but as a mindless mob encouraged by a corrupt empress to attack the foreign diplomatic compounds in what was then called Peking. The script was uninterested in nuance, preferring jingoistic tone and nationalistic stereotypes. To be fair, the words cultural sensitivity were not in the Hollywood lexicon in 1962, and the film should be viewed in the context of its time. The emphasis is on action and spectacle, and spectacular it is. Producer Samuel Bronston chose Spain to shoot his epics, where lavish sets and huge crowd scenes were cheap. He filled his backlot with extras recruited from Chinese restaurants and laundries across Europe. He hired Nicholas Ray for the second time as director. Ray had performed satisfactorily for him on his first Spanish production, King of Kings, which had been a commercial success. What could go wrong? Plenty. His stars, Charlton Heston, Ava Gardner, and David Niven, all thought the script needed work. In fact, at their first meeting, Ava Gardner launched into a lengthy polemic, shredding her part as written. Also, the casting of Caucasian actors in Asian makeup diminished the credibility of their scenes. You are well, Sir Arthur? I am well, if you are well, Your Majesty. The pressures of production took its toll on Nicholas Ray, who for years had problems with alcohol and drugs. Similar issues afflicted co-star Ava Gardner. Charlton Heston wrote in his journal, she was irrational, combative, constantly late, would walk off the set for trifling reasons, and her performance was frequently lackluster. Ten weeks into the shoot, Nicholas Ray collapsed on the set with a serious heart attack. The director of the acclaimed Rebel Without a Cause, amongst others, would never direct another movie again. With Niven's booking on another picture fast approaching, Gardner's continuing tantrums and no director, the movie was in real trouble. The Bronston executives, preoccupied with virulent internal rivalries, were indecisive. So Heston basically took over. He brought in British director Guy Green, who directed him in Diamond Head for the remaining dialogue scenes, while Andrew Martin, who directed the chariot race in Ben-Hur, created vigorous battle scenes. Shooting resumed around the clock with day and night crews. Heston took up residence in his dressing room and shuttled back and forth between the two units, sleeping when he could. Thus, six weeks' work was completed in three. Niven finished all his scenes before his stop date, the Ava Gardner problem was solved by killing her character earlier than scripted. Edited by the Bronston executives to a ponderous two and a half hours, albeit with excellent battle scenes, 
the movie fizzled in the US, though it did better internationally. Its saving grace is a rousing score by Dmitry Tiomkin, which almost knits the picture together. Mm -hmm. 